let me give uh, an introduction to David. So we've been doing this for almost almost two years, and it's been fun to get to know David. For those um, who don't know David, and I'm assuming everyone does, but I'll just mention David is a internationally known speaker and researcher. He's a phenomenal clinician and has been curious his entire career. Um, he does um, live hands-on courses. He's one of the pioneers <laughs> in that space. Um, he's still teaching to this day, and people come from all over the country. And, and David, you tell me if I'm wrong, maybe even the world, to come and learn from him. So it's, it's a gift to get to learn from him when we have the chance. And uh, because of his like long-term curiosity, David has built a massive network of other talented uh, clinicians that bring their own unique perspective into dentistry. And David has been so gracious to invite those friends to come and join these monthly podcast or these monthly webinar series with him, uh, our Real Talk with David Hornbrook. So David, thank you as always for hosting these with us. Uh, we're grateful for you and what you give back to the industry in running these. And uh, we're grateful to have Marcus on with us tonight. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Steve, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, this is our 21st. So we've done uh, just about two years. And originally it was kind of our gift back to dentistry because people were getting bored of the typical Zoom meetings. And people couldn't go out and learn in person. And so I thought, you know what, let's do something fun where instead of a host and someone, a speaker they've never met, I would just invite my friends, people I think that they're the very best at what they do. And we just had a really good time. And tonight's going to be really extra special. Um, I do want to thank Dental Intelligence, Dental Intel. If you haven't used them, look it up. They're one of our primary sponsors and Steve works for them. And they've been just uh, so generous in, in hosting these and allowing us to make this affordable. It's free as well as providing CE. And then Utah Valley Dental Lab, who most of you know does all my work there in, in Linden, Utah. And they're also a primary sponsor. Again, their goal is to just share information. And that's our goal as well. So let's have some fun. You know, Marcos and I, um, we were talking earlier, for those that were on early, um, Marcos is Peruvian, and I'm a huge Peruvian food fan, and I can't get any in San Diego. That's home for me. Um, I told him that I, when I met my wife in Miami, right down the street was the most amazing restaurant that every time I flew out to Miami is because we were at a two-year long-distance relationship. I'd want to go there three or four times on the weekend and I just can't find that anymore. And I'm so, I'm so bummed out about that, but he's from Peru. He's a, absolutely a master clinician. You know, if people say that I do good dentistry, it's because I have a good lab and I'm quite frankly, and, and Marcos with his artistic ability with composite and resins. I mean, that separates, I think a, a good clinician from a, a really great masterful clinician. Some of the stuff that I've seen him do, it, it just blows me away. And it, it's like, I wish I could do that, but I don't, I don't quite have his skill, but he's at the university. Um, we, we've known each other for several years. I think the last time that we actually spent quality time together, we were in a restaurant, a seafood restaurant in Manhattan, if you remember that. Um, yep. a great restaurant. We had a, a great conversation and we kind of just bonded. So for those that don't know, I spend uh, four to five days a week in Mexico and I practice two to three day week, three days a week in San Diego. So I'm in Mexico. You can see my tequila. I collect tequila. A lot of you know that have been in these programs. And I have about 250 bottles. And I was telling Marcus, I, I, I saw, look at all the books behind you. And I said, oh, holy cow. I mean, I haven't read that many books ever, you know, dating back to second grade. I, I, I couldn't put, I couldn't fill a mantle full of that. So I, so I asked him earlier for those that weren't here. I said, you know, I've tasted all this tequila. Have you read all those books? And what was your answer, Marcos? Uh, there's only one here that I haven't read. <laughs> I don't think that I was great. It's a background. It says a background. Everybody can see the background. I am at home, so don't get fooled by the library behind me, like David did. I did. I even asked about the chair. I said, "That's a nice chair. Where'd you get the chair?" Turns out that's part of the background, and it's like, "All right, all right." No wonder it doesn't look worn out. But anyway, Marcus, show us what you got. And this is live, as we talked about. Make sure that if you have any questions. And if it's apropos for the time, or maybe I'll interrupt a little later, I mean, Marcos is going to thrive on <clears throat> this interaction um, versus being a typical Zoom where he just speaks and he shuts it off at the end. This is live. So if you have any questions, I'll interrupt him when, when need be, and we can answer the questions. But if you have questions, I want you to put it in the chat, not the Q&A, the chat. And this is live. And it will be recorded um, for those that maybe want a colleague or a friend or a team member to watch this in the future. Steve will send out a link, a YouTube link um, that'll be out sometime next week. So 
Marcos, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know that you're in central time, so it's a little later there than it is out here on the coast, but appreciate you taking the time and spending time with us. No, no, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. You know, we were talking before and just great conversations we have had over the years and great dinners. And I really feel honored to be here. There's no doubt about it. And you are such a good clinician, a teacher, a master, what is the things you do. So um, it's really, I feel humbled by the good words of, uh, you know, about my work, but thank you very much for having me here. It's really, it's really okay. great. And yes, I, 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 like we talk about it. I like um, to have a conversation, you know, when you, you invite me, it's like, oh, this is great because as a teacher, sometimes um, we just go and regurgitate and talk about things, but I like kind of the interaction because I do believe that the, the guests here, they are going to learn more if we just go back and forth uh, with questions and, and the questions they have, because that's, that's kind of a important to me that, I can teach something to the people. So let me show some slides and then let's see what questions come in. We can go in any tangent uh, that people wants to follow. A lot of people have questions. It's me to, in, instead of me just going at a subject, I like when there is these <coughs> interactions. So let's, let's get at it. Like um, David said, I am from Peru and I'm very proud of being a Peruvian and I'm sure a lot of you know a little bit about Peru and probably the place that most people is know, people knows Peru is because um, Machu Picchu, that's kind of the crown jewel of Peru. And this is the city of Lima, you're seeing right now, it's in the coast, it's really good seafood, I will say. Peru is a great place to visit, really good people. I think it's, we call it Peruvian nice. Um, and you, you will go there, you will enjoy you know, everything we have there as a culture, as food and things like that. So visit Peru, if you have done, you haven't been there, you will be very, very happy yeah, you did visit Peru. I teach at the University of Iowa, um, where I bring you greetings. It's a place that I've been there for a long time. I teach grad undergraduate students. Uh, I love to teach especially uh, dental students because they are kind of, a lot of them, they are the, the ones that really they, they have this inquiring mind <clears throat> and they want to learn more. So I'm very happy to, uh, as I have a passion for teaching. So for today, I'm going to tell you what I know, what I believe, what I do in my practice, uh, a lot of what we teach at the University of Iowa. All the cases you are going to be seeing today are cases that I've done in my private practice. There is no Photoshop or anything like that or any of the cases maybe just cutting exposure adjustments, but the dentistry has not been altered. Uh, you're going to have a recording of these, so you know, not necessarily you will have to take notes. So again, I will hopefully we'll have a back and forth interaction of these. But every time that I talk to people, wherever it is the audience, middle, high or low level is, hopefully I can teach you something that you can use in your practice tomorrow for your own benefit and benefit of your patients. So um, one of the things, uh, talking about the title is, um, what are the dentistry, in dentistry and resin composites, what are the things you could do and cannot do and when to do resin composites mm -hmm. compared to porcelain and things like that, you know, the, so the possibilities with resin composites. So just let me tell you a little bit of uh, cases that I've done through my career and then we can go back and forth. And this is a patient of mine, or actually this is a referral patient that comes to me <coughs> a referral from a dentist and says, I am very unhappy. And he calls me you now and says, hey, uh, I'm going to refer you to my wife, my wife. So I want you to do a restoration. And I say, yeah, I'll be happy to do it. And a little bit naive, right? Because I didn't know, I, he never referred me patients. So I'm saying, okay, I'll just your wife. Maybe you don't wanna do the work because sometimes we don't want necessarily do anything with family and friends because yeah, I don't necessarily wanna do work with my wife. Uh, but um, anyway, so she comes in, she's kind of a really dry person, but I don't mind at all. She says, I'm unhappy about these restorations, and I think you can see the upper right central incisor, she's not happy about it, and, and, and looks okay to me in the sense of functional, correct? So when we look at something like this, 
you might have a radiograph, you can take a radiograph in, there is no decay, you know, there is perfectly functional and, and there is no word facets. Patient doesn't have a traumatic occlusion, doesn't grind. You can see she's a, and, and she was in her fifties at that time. When you look at the canines, you can see very minimal anywhere. So you know that this is canine function. When you go to protrusive, every, everything is working, but there is no wear facets. So functionally, you know, composite will work really well. So it will be a porcelain. And she also is into conservative dentistry, right? Because the husband kind of likes that mentality too. So anyway, she's unhappy about the restoration. Uh, she says, my tooth doesn't look natural. Okay, I understand a little bit where you're coming from. And she says, you know what? You probably having noise. And she's kind of a little aggressive. And she says, probably you having noticed this. But when you look at my tooth, compared to the feeling that my husband did, and I'm thinking, what? Your husband never told me that he did the feeling. And then I say, when did he do the feeling? He says, like about a month ago. And I'm thinking, oh, thank you, bud, for letting me know that you already did a feeling that your wife is not happy about it. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, okay, let's see what can we do here. And she says, keep talking about how different this feeling looks from what she has. And then she, she says, my tooth, if you look at this tooth, give me the mirror, she says. And of course, right? She grabs the mirror and puts it this close. And then look at this. And then she reaches for the light and points the light and starts telling me all these things. You have had those patients, David. Yeah. And she says, well, there is some gray down here. Oh yeah, that's a translucency of the inside ledge, right? And she says, but you don't see this, but there is a white line in the edge. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, yeah, that's the halo. Oh my God, this woman knows more than I know. Or, or maybe as much as I know. <laughs> and I say, I just say, what do you do? And she says, uh, I'm a hygienist. Oh, okay. Thanks, Bart, for letting me know that she's also in the <laughs> dental field. Right? So, and she says, I have a wavy line down here. And of course, we know that as a dentin and lobes. And there is my tooth, and she says, if you wouldn't have gloves. If I show you my nail, she goes with the nail. My tooth is not smooth and flat. Okay, well, this is me at that point. <laughs> what am I going to do with this, right? So I say, okay, yeah, I think I understand everything you, you, you want. And I understand um, that you want something that looks very natural. And I say, I can do maybe better that one you have. And I told her, there is no way I can do better than nature. Because one of the lines over the years that I think has helped me with patients is to say, well, your, your original tooth was given to you by God, nature. And whatever I can do as a human, never going to be as good as God and nature. And I think that kind of rings a bell on people to say, hey, yeah, you know what? This is given by God, nature how this human is going to do as good or better than nature. So I think that line, I've used it when patients like this tend to have high expectations of the things that we can do as a dentist. Because realistically, you know, we all have had these patients with unrealistic expectations. So I kind of, she kind of pause a little bit and she says, yes, you know what? But if you can do it better, that'll be great. So. By saying those lines, I know that these people with high expectations, I am kind of uh, putting those expectations down, all right? So this is the restoration that we did for her. And this was long, long time ago. And when I show her, um, in that time, I didn't have a concept of maybe showing them with a mirror because <laughs> nowadays we know when we show, when you give them the mirror, you want to have their mirror to a good distance. You don't want to give it to them because they immediately put it this close and they start seeing all the details. So that's another thing that I communicate and help people, younger people to uh, tell you that when you show your work to somebody, don't give them the mirror in the sense of giving the hand in the mirror because they would put it this close 
And that's where the analytical part of the brain kicks in and they are going to be very analytical. So you give them the mirror and just keep the mirror from distance or don't give it to them until they see it first at a distance. Because when they see it as a distance, all of a sudden it's like they, they see the whole face, the smile, and whatever you did is really integrating into that smile, into that face. So the first impression is a good first impression. So I think that that helps a lot. So when I show uh, uh, the people nowadays, I show at a distance, but she kind of knew how she came in. She was very analytical. She grabbed the mirror and she was satisfied with this case. So I, I look back on this case, it's like, I was nervous doing the case because I thought that I could do it better, but the high expectation of the patients were a little bit, you know, um, when I was younger, really um, a little challenging for me, but I think over the years, I, I, I've done better with this. And I'm sure that maybe you have plenty of stories of people being that picky too, am oh, I right? Yeah. Absolutely, so we, we used to have, it's kind of funny you talk about the mirror. <clears throat> so we no longer have in our office, but we had the mirror that was one times magnification on one side and five times on the other, right? So typically the patient, you know, would bring the five times. So what we ended up doing at the time, this is several years ago, I took a picture of Brad Pitt and put it on the five times. And the other one for a woman, I put Angelina Jolie. So they would hold up and look at the one time magnification. They would turn it around thinking they're going to get a man. And all of a sudden they're looking at Brad Pitt and I said, oh my God, you look like Brad Pitt. <laughs> and it, 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 it kind of mediated that a little bit because you're absolutely right. I have a lot of those patients. That's a really good trick. You know what, because I, you know, all of a sudden I'm thinking, I'm just uh, seeing it, you know, imagine it. Yeah. And probably people is like, oh my God, they just start laughing. You know, the expectations are lower a little bit, even though, you know, sometimes it's, I know the work you do is spectacular, but you know, you're doing a good job and, but it's still you're apprehensive about how they are going to react to it. So yeah. that's a great trick, David, very nice. <laughs> So um, there are cases I can show you. This is a patient that uh, is unhappy about, again, number eight. And I know, obviously, when we look at this, we know that probably something went wrong, or it was chase selection, or the opacity of the material is not good. I think probably in this case, they have a very good chase selection. I think really what happened is that the composite they used for this restoration was too translucent. So it lets the light go through, right? Because we know that dental companies, they make materials in different character <laughs> optical characteristics. They have materials that imitate dentin, dentin-like materials. They have enamel-like materials. They are materials that they, are, they have the translucency of enamel, so they are much more translucent. And there are companies also that makes materials kind of intermediate opacity that is kind of in between dentin and enamel. That's kind of the universal kind of type of material that serves all purposes. So in this case, I think what they did is select a material that was enamel-like or too translucent. So we just go ahead and uh, remove that restoration and put a new one. And their patient is happy about it and we're happy. And I think this is one example of not choosing the right opacity in this case. This case is an interesting case because she is a very young female that um, is unhappy about the tooth. So I'm looking at these students, I'm thinking, well, I, and she's very young and being a young patient, I do not want to do any indirect restoration. I want to do something that is direct, that is going to maybe with very, very, you know, very, very minimal preparation. So we end up doing changes that composite Still, you can see a little of the darkness in here as it gets thinner towards the gingiva. I love to work with the rubber dam, so with the rubber dam, I can retract the gingiva. Uh, dropper margin is slightly sub gingiva, I would say three, two, two, two tenths of a millimeter at most. <clears throat> and then I can do a, a composite. Somebody can say, hey, I'm going to do a porcelain veneer in this case, because my technician is great at doing these things. And I will say, absolutely, you know, that's something that it also can be resolved with a ceramic restoration. Um, just keep going with the cases. This is kind of hey, interesting. Mar Marcos, can I, can I interrupt you here? Because well, you know, yeah, yeah. what I see a lot, you, you mentioned the rubber dam. 
And so what I've seen, I mean, personally, I don't do a lot of composite veneers anymore, but you know, when I did, and I still do class fours and, and big class threes is when, when do you take the shade? When do you, are you going to go over that? Because you know, what I've seen is people put the rubber dam on, they desiccate the teeth, but pick the composite. It, it looks amazing. Then when teeth rehydrate, all of a sudden that restoration is a lot brighter than, than the rest of the teeth. So are you going to talk about that or do you have any suggestions? Yeah, no, no I definitely, a little later on, we'll talk about shade selection because there are, seen there are different parts um, that they are very important when you think about what makes a composite at the end successful. It has to be functional and it has to be aesthetic. There are the two pretty much components of any successful restoration, right? It has to be aesthetic and it has to be functional. So um, we'll talk about what are the steps as a dentist that take us to have functional aesthetic restorations. Like even when you think <clears throat> about cases like this, um, you think about it and you say, what am I going to do here? Am I going to do a porcelain veneer? Or I'm going to do a resin veneer? And well, let's think about the options here, right? Somebody, there are people in one camp that is going to say, no, I am going to send it prep it, impress, put a temporary center to the lab, come back and see it. And so people are going to say, no, this patient is too young to have an indirect restoration. And I'm kind of a little bit in the middle uh, of both. I will think about a lot of factors when I decide to do porcelain and when I decide to do uh, resin. Living in Iowa, um, compared to the East or West Coast, prices are not as high probably in the East and West Coast, correct? So, and at the same time, I can tell mm -hmm. you that the best technicians are in the East and the West Coast. But at the same time, prices in the East and the West Coast compared to the Midwest, they're much more are higher. So a technician in the East and the West Coast is going to cost me much more to do a, a ceramic restoration in my particular case so that my patients can not necessarily afford, not all of them can afford it. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, you know, if I'm going to charge this patient certain amount of money and I have to pay so much more, much more to get a beautiful restoration from a master technician, oh, this patient may not be able to afford something like this. And that was the case, somebody very young in college, there's no way they can afford a porcelain veneer from, a, from the degree of what they want, correct? To satisfy their demands. And at the same time, I had to ask myself, if I don't use a master technician, I might be able to do this to satisfy her. So it's something that we need to ask ourselves, right? Um, if we have a lot of practice and because this restoration, you have to practice. It's not a matter of just taking a course and doing them. I think there is a, a learning curve on doing all these. So I will say, if I can do it, and my patient not necessarily can afford one of these masters, the masters, master technicians to do something like this, I'm going to do it in resin. Or you might have a, you know, on the contrary, you might have a patient that, you know, money is not an issue and you can charge him more and be able to do a good work. And with a minimal preparation, you can do a porcelain veneer. So from the aesthetic point of view, one question, one is, can, you, can we do it as a dentist, whatever is direct or indirect, and how we feel a little comfortable doing it? The next question is, if we have a technician, our technician is able to do something like this because it has to be a master technician. And so those are the finances of the patients. That those are things that I go about to decide one or the other one. Other important consideration is the functional portion because we need to talk about functional here, right? Every time that I'm thinking one material I'm going to use in a patient, I'm thinking what is my functional risk um, or your biomechanical risk? And then I look at the occlusion of the patient and they have a balanced occlusion. I <coughs> see that uh, when they are going to protrude or lateral movements, there's a group of teeth function, functioning in protrusive. It's not only one single tooth. I look at the opposing ones and they are nice aligned so I can get a good anterior guidance. I know that functionally that restoration is going to be protected by adjacent teeth. If I see that there's a lot of wear facet, the canine is wear down, and that probably is not necessarily going to be a good case for composite because it's going to break, it's going to fracture. 
or when there is misalignment or there are crooked teeth on the bottom, if there is only one tooth going into the protrusive and the patient is not willing to do ortho or any adjustments for that, then I know my restoration is not going to last very long. It's going to fail because composite is inherently weaker than porcelain. So that would be a consideration that we'll have to use. If a patient has a, a little more traumatic occlusion and there's only one single tooth in protrusive or there's a crooked tooth at the bottom that is producing that protrusive in that single tooth, well, I probably do a ceramic uh, in, the, in, in, in a case like this. So again, different things that we need to look before we decide what to do uh, as a restorative material. In this case, functional demands, I can do either one. I can do a composite, I can do a ceramic. Financially, she couldn't afford it. So I'm thinking, okay, there definitely is a case that I have to do the best I can with a resin. And probably a master ceramist would have done a better job that I did here, I, because I can criticize, you can see, is, you know, there's a little more translucent, the darkness showing through. Uh, really a master ceramist can do something that nobody can see it, but you can see the, the limitations also of the resins. And at the same time, that I think it's another limitations uh, or consideration is what are your patient expectations? If your patient has very, very high expectations, <clears throat> I know that I'm very likely I won't be able to achieve this with resin because sometimes there's so many um, characteristics in the tooth, halo, translucency, that is really hard or in, almost impossible to do in resins that I need to do a porcelain veneer or, or an in, indirect restoration and I need to use this master ceramic. So again, patient expectations. I need to gauge what are my patient expectations. And I'm going to make them happy at the end, especially if they come for an aesthetic reason. So I think those are the things that I look to decide what materials I'm going to use. Yeah, you know, you know, Marcus, I, I think another thing too that you didn't mention was, was the time, right? I mean, you live in a college town, you know, you practice in a college town. And, you know, I was San Diego State and UCSD in San Diego, same thing where people come in, they have another dentist on the other side of the country or the middle of the country and they broke a tooth or they have a situation like that and they've got three months that they're in or maybe two weeks. You know, in San Diego, it seems like they don't come in until like, a week before they're going to go back home right and they want it fixed where we have to do a direct because of the time a lot i mean i just can't get the case back from the ceramics in time and and i think it's and this is why i'm so excited about what you're teaching tonight is because this gives us another tool in our tool belt and i think too many dentists are are i mean that last case was gorgeous and i don't know if a ceramist could have done any better than that, honestly but I think having that tool in our tool belt. So when a patient comes in and can't afford a thousand to two thousand dollars for a veneer, can we offer them something that looks beautiful and that's going to function? And you know, I think that's that's like a missing link. You know, I think that your students in, in Iowa are lucky that they have you that can teach them the stuff because I think most of us were not taught to do this type of type of dentistry in dental school. Yeah, I know that, that's a couple of good points that you bring, you know, those patients that don't have the time and you have to do it, absolutely. And the second point, I was lucky to have great mentors you know, through my career and great friends. And I was, you know, acknowledge the mentors that I had. You know, Jerry Dennehy, great oh, yeah. composite resins. He's taught so many good people um, in the past. And uh, Bob Marges, good friend of mine. You know Bob Marges. Yeah, I think oh, everybody yeah. knows oh, Bob. Yeah. Great guy. Good friend of mine. He, he was one of, one of my teachers and he's still one of my teachers and good friends. And we do a lot of stuff together. And I had people in my, in my life, my dad, um, he's a dentist, he's retired, but I have good mentors to my life that allow me to, to learn these composite resins too. And then kind of try to do, do as good as they do. So in this case, it's a very young lady and she comes to me, the mom brings her, she is seven, eight, nine years old. And she tells me, hey, you know what? Um, somebody wants to do a veneer, a crown on this tooth. And I look at something like this and the tooth is not even completely wrapped. You, you, you barely see those laterals coming out. There is no way I'm going to do something indirect in this case. And we just put a little composite, um, but a preparation that has to be minimal preparation because we don't want to see those margins. When we talk about a little bit of cavity preparation too, 
and you want to hide this composite, make it blend <clears throat> into the structure. And they were so happy about it. I was, I was happy because they were happy about it. And I think it's a good case to, uh, to show the how practical and how conservative are because my preparation in this case, the only thing I had to do is put my rubber dam and my corroborate the preparation. And that's the only thing you have to do in this case. So conservative. So, and that's the beauty of resins. They are so conservative and they can last for very, very, very many years. So like, I'm just going to borrow one of the sentences you say, David, it's another tool on the toolbox because, you know, there are different tools for the situation. And a composite is something that I think as a dentist, uh, we can provide to our patients for their benefits and, and, you know, and maintain a tooth for long periods of time. A little more um, larger cases. He's a very young patient too. And mom brings him in. He's a 12 year old kid and he is just don't care. He doesn't care about how he looks. You know, who cares? Mom, right? Mom is the one that cares. And she kind of drags the kid in <clears throat> and, you know, please do something about it. And he's 12 years old. I don't think I'm cutting a crown. So you can choose a crown. You can choose a veneer or the direct restorations. I think any of these probably will work really well. But again, because it's a young patient, I see the big benefit for these patients. So what we did is we did some internal bleaching and, you know, pretty much redo that restoration. And he's happy. I was able to do a little bit of the staining and the mamelons. It's just kind of more sometimes for my own kind of a um, satisfaction sometimes because a lot of patients don't see it. But I was very happy uh, uh, with this final restoration. Again, we did internal bleaching, external bleaching, and then we changed, just changed that restoration. You know, you can think about also augmentation. This is a case in which it's a young patient and just augment augmentation. You could do a crown or a three quarter crown, a veneer, a no prep uh, veneer, and, and then you're good. In this case, I just did two composite resins. I can show you a lot of cases that I've done with horse in a new situation. And if you haven't seen the, um, the, the, the recording that uh, Dennis Wells did with David, there's a very good interaction going back and forth about very, very conservative porcelain laminaires. Dennis pretty much does not prep the tooth. He just take an impression, send it to the lab. Nelson Rigo, that's a very technician, and he's a lab with his brother. And do, they do amazing work with the ceramics. And, but, uh, but again, you know, that's a, a way to do it. And again, that's a tool in your toolbox. And this is uh, a do it with resin. She was quite happy with the result blends really nicely. And again, the blending is dictated by, you know, one is the shade of the tooth, including opacity and translucency. And the other one is the shape of the tooth. So when we do composite, we are kind of the technician. So we need to be thinking in those two particular uh, aspects. One is the shade and the other one is the opacity of the material. So quite happy. Uh, this is a, a closer view. We did some, a little bit crown lengthening could, could we send her to uh, ortho to get a better, better alignment? Yes, we, can, we could, and, but we didn't because the patient, well, actually we offer, but the patient didn't do it. Because nowadays I think ortho and pedio are very good uh, in multidisciplinary treatment with restorative, whatever we do, composites or crowns or, or porcelain. I'm always thinking is the position of the teeth that I have good or ideal for do my restorative work. Also the, the, the pink, the gingiva, is the gingiva in the adequate position to do the best restorative uh, aesthetic work that I can do. That's another case. Somebody comes to me and says, hey, would you do these veneers again? And I'm looking at this, it's like, oh, I, they, they look very dark. I am going to, I wanna do porcelain veneers in this case. And the patient tells me, hey, I have a, these resins for 25 years and would you please do it again? Because I don't wanna do any portions. I don't have necessarily uh, finances to do it. And who am I to say if, if these veneers have lasted for 25 years without chipping, yeah, they have this color, but they haven't break or they're perfectly fine. So functionally, that's another cue to me to say functionally, 
I can do pretty much composite because she's not breaking things, right? So an option on the table is composite. And she say, please, you know, consider doing, I wanna do porcelain. And she says, will you please do it? And I'm thinking, yes, I probably can do it because again, functional demands are going to be minimal and I can do with composites. I know that aesthetically she wants better, but she doesn't want perfect. So that's another situation, very low aesthetic demands so that I can do something like this that is direct resin. So we, yes, we can see, we do a lot of bleaching. So we did bleaching of the upper arch. We removed some of those uh, composite, took impressions that now you got vital bleaching, did some bleaching upper and lower arches, she comes back and we change that restoration for um, new restorations. Very happy, she was very happy. So another case, this is the tetracycline stains. <clears throat> and these restorations last for a very long time. And then we'll talk about the questions, the question, because I'm sure a lot of you are thinking in terms of longevity, what does last longer and how do they look? So let's, let's, let's look, about, look at this case and talk about that. So again, very patient that functional demands, when you look at this, those teeth, she's a very petite lady, there's no functional demands. So is resin, is porcelain going to be better than resin? Yeah, functionally, no, no, there's no, no, because functionally they are going to work really well. Now the next question is aesthetically going to work as good. And I will say that if you have a very good technician, porcelain is going to look better and especially it's going to look better over the years. So when I talk about a patient and I offer them the option, when the option is there, like I know that not functional demands, and I say to the patient, yes, we could do porcelain or we can do ceramic. And I tell them porcelain is going to last you a little bit longer, not necessarily a lot longer, but the most important is that that ceramic is going to look, it's going to age very well. That's what I tell them. It's going to age, age nicely. Meaning when you look at composite, when composite ages, attract more stain <coughs> than porcelain because it's, it's a little bit porous in the nature and there's uh, a traps, traps some of the, the, the stain from the food, uh, the drinks, drink, uh, tea, wine, things like that is stain tea. So I tell them, I also ask them about their habits, right? If they drink a lot of coffee and wine, I know that my composites are not going to last very long because they are going to stain much faster than ceramic. So I will tell the patient, in your case, you smoke or not, or you drink, things like that. My composite is not going to last very long and I give it the reasons. And if you're doing this for aesthetics, for longevity, you are better off doing porcelain. But our patients that they don't drink red wine, maybe they only drink white wine, they don't drink coffee or tea, that I know that they're not going to stain, I can say, yeah. And then the function that the man is not great, I would say composite is a good alternative for you. So that's how I, how I did, can I talk about composite versus porcelain? So, hey, Mark, and, Marcus, can I, can I interrupt you here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know people me. probably have the same question I do. So, you know, I do a lot of porcelain and the question that always comes up from my patient is how long are these going to last, right? So, you know, my practice, I tell them 15 plus years because that's kind of where we're at. What, with composite, what do you tell? So let's say the patient doesn't drink black tea and doesn't smoke. What are you telling them longevity? I'm saying 12 to 15 years. Okay. Yeah. Because, because... I, that's what I see, you know, um, and I will say to them, if you keep good hygiene, you brush your teeth, close your teeth, and you are not drinking wine and tea and a lot of food that might stain your teeth, they're going to last you 10, 12, 15 years. Okay. And just to show you this case, this is 15 <clears throat> years later. And yes, it does not look like maybe a porcelain in 15 years. But for the composite, 15 year looks pretty good, I would say, correct? So, you know, of course, over the years, this is going to keep suffering. And this is 18 years that you have that. And yes, it doesn't look as good as porcelain probably at 18 years in the same patient, but you're looking at an 18 years, a very good service. 
these researchers had no chip whatsoever. And again, you <coughs> see the lower chip there, this alignment of the lowers, and she's not putting in functional demands. There's no wear. Look at this, the K9, look at this K9. Has no wear down whatsoever. Look at the upper K9, no wear, nothing. No wear facets. So <coughs> you know that there's no functional demands over those. Now, yeah, you get into the 22, 20, the 20 years, and then you start seeing, well, look at the patient, they start bleaching their own, the white strips and things like that. And all of a sudden they, the restoration don't look as good as they used to. But this is what I cannot tell the patients about how long do they last. Um, and I do expect, and I see, I've been doing this for, you know, 30 years in Iowa. And I've seen a lot of the patients coming back and the majority, I would say the majority of the patients, they can expect 10, 12, 15 years out of the good set of porcelain amine years done well. And again, in this small population of patients, I call it a small because most people drink coffee, tea, and red wine, you know, realistically that's what people do. So for this subset of people that they are really good, I think composite reds is a great solution you know, for them. That's about what I would tell them. So when I think about this and I say, all right, well, you know, um, seems like you guys in Iowa, well, this seems like there's a good history in Iowa doing composite. Okay, tell me, what do I need to know? I think there are a little few different things that we need to know to do good composite resins, right? And I will say, we need to know to the structure. We need to know what are we replacing? Basically, we know as dentists, we're replacing enamel and then that's basically what we're doing. And there are two very different tissues, right? We need to know the materials. What materials are we going to use to replace to the structure? Because these materials somehow need to imitate the optical properties of the enamel and dentin. And we, know, we need to know techniques that allow us to make these artificial materials look as good as possible with, when restoring anterior teeth. So we know, what do we know about the optical properties of teeth? We know the teeth had color and there are certain opacity and translucency and they are kind of a, um, there's fluorescent that comes with dentin and there's opalescence that comes from the enamel. These properties are not necessarily that uh, important. The, the two fluorescent and opalescence and more important is color and opacity of the material we're using or the natural to the structure. So, in, in general terms, dentin gives us <coughs> color. So the color from the tooth comes from the inside, give us the opaque portion that blocks the light to going through the dark part of the mouth and give us that shape of the lobes of the dentin and lobes that that patient mentioned. Remember the wife of the dentist that had those wavy lines, that's because the lobes, she's, she's, she's seeing the lobes through the um, clear or translucent inside a ledge and the dentist is fluorescent. So what is enamel? What enamel is give us the shape, give us the texture that the patient was saying is too smooth, modifies the dentin color. So that's important to know that the color comes from the inside, but the enamel in the outer layer modifies. So the final shade of the tooth is the interaction between an opaque dentin material and a, a more translucent outer layer that is enamel. So the final shade is the interaction of those the optical properties of those two tissues. And there's the opalescence and the light reflecting the size of ledge give us the halo, all right? So just show you, just to show you a, a little bit of a, a, a section of a tube, you can see if you take a photograph and you can see certain shade, you can see that if you remove the enamel from this tube, the shade is going to be different. The shade in general terms is going to be a little brighter. So dentin tends to be a little brighter, brighter with a lot of color. And the enamel changes that color of the dentin because it's more translucent, reduces the value and increases translucency. That's the effect. So we have a core that is opaque and rich in color and an outer layer that is more translucent, less in color. And that's the final appearance of uh, natural teeth that we see uh, when we're doing this. So that, I think that's quite important. The, the other aspect that is important to know regarding the teeth is with age, teeth are going to change. 
very young teeth are fairly opaque. You know, as we age, our teeth are going to become more mineralized and more translucent and darker. And what happened is that you think about it is, well, if enamel was changing the color of that dentin, and the enamel is fairly porous, but with the years becomes more translucent, it's going to show more that darker dentin in the inside. And also the stains from the food and things like that drinks are going to make our teeth a little more um, in the sinks, a little more opaque. So you bring us to maybe materials, right? So what is out there? What materials we have uh, available to us out there? Well, there is a lot of materials out there that we could choose. A lot of people tells me, um, what is the best material that I can use in my practice? And you think about it as like, what is the best material? I get the question all the time. There are so many materials out there. Which one is the best? What, what should I buy? And I can tell you that it's very hard to find a bad material nowadays. I think through the years, dental companies and sciences to the point that I think we can find very, very good materials out there in the market. I am hard to press to find a bad one. I think most important when we talk about a composite is to get familiar with the material. The more you know your material, the best you are going to do. The more you practice, the better your results are going to be. So I'm not gonna tell you that it's very easy, but I'm gonna tell you that practice, practice, experience will make you do better composites that you can do nowadays. So let's move a little bit to you know, some of the techniques, right? And um, when I'm thinking about techniques, you talk to your patient and you decide, what are you going to do, correct? And you choose to do composite. So let's talk a little about our shake selection. How do we go about selecting a good shake? Number one, I will I remember I say there are some points that I think we need to know very important to um, talk about um, doing good composites. Well, we need to know through the structure, composite, and techniques. With the techniques, well, the first thing is shake selection. We cannot do anything good, whatever it's a crown, whatever it's a composite or a porcelain veneer, without having a good shake selection. And we are doing indirect. It's about the communication with your lab, so they can give you what you want that is going to blend with your seed and your patient. With composites, you are responsible for pretty much everything. So say selection, what is the two shade? Again, as I mentioned before, is given by the interaction of the um, enamel that is light and translucent compared to uh, the dentin that is opaque as the shade, right? That's basically what we have uh, regarding that. So, uh, let me exit here and just change a little bit to a, 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 my other presentation, David. You have any comments so far right now? Because I yeah, you know, I do. I do have one because I think it's some. So you know, you tell your patients it's going to last eleven to fifteen years, and you know, you're at a university. I don't know if you have hygiene in your practice or not, but you know, in my practice, I get a lot of patients from out of town that come in to fly in, and I do veneers on them, porcelain. And I've got to give very explicit instructions because they're going to go home and some hygienist is going to use new pro course and, you know, air abrasion. So, you know, I'm not as worried with the porcelain being damaged, but you obviously you're taking all that time to polish and I'm sure you're going to go over that polish the resin. What instructions are you giving the patient to tell not only their hygienist, but as far as toothpaste? Yeah, I tell them to use regular toothpaste. Don't use any of the bleaching. Don't use any tartar control toothpaste. Just use your regular Crest, your regular Colgate. Okay. Because we know that they are not abrasive. That's a very good question, David. Because like you say, in ceramic, we don't worry about it. Now with the, you know, with zirconia, we just don't worry about it because they are not going, the abrasiveness of these toothpaste are not anything to create any damage in, on ceramics. But in composite, yeah, they can, they can remove the, the glaze, they can scratch it. And if it's not polished completely, the scratches are going to attract the stains and things like that. So I tell them, just tell your hygienist that um, use a fine polishing paste and that will remove any stains that you might accumulate it. 
and kind of be gentle when they're scaling a group planning. That's my instructions to them when my hygienist is not going to see it. Yeah, we, right. I have two hygienists. Um, when I'm working, I have two hygienists okay. uh, doing, doing their work. So that's what I tell them. And my hygienists at, at work, they use fine uh, polishing paste in these cases. And I can tell you that rarely, rarely, yeah, I can maybe count the cases, maybe one or two cases that my hygienist is grab a composite and, and chipped it or, 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 right. or remove it from the cervical area. It might have happened when I have dentin margins because the bone to dentin over time fails. But when you have margins in enamel, that should not really happen that, that you're going to chip or remove because the bonding is bad. We're bonding to enamel, doing a good bonding. Those restorations should mm -hmm. not come out. They yeah. should just should not come out. You know, if, if my restoration, if I have a restoration, I, I never had a restoration, a knock on wood, that the patient has come to me and says, oh, the restoration has come out. Like a crown might have debonded. No, I had cheap composite because the patient might be, I made a bad diagnostic and the patient would start bruxing and cheap restoration, or they would eat in and bit into a fork. Something like that might cheap it. But again, going back to the, the hygienist, I think I think the good recommendation is fine polishing paste when they are doing, uh, and then just regular toothpaste. That's what I tell my patients. Are you are you having your hygienist not use an ultrasonic or sonic scaler around the margins, or that doesn't bother you either? No, that doesn't bother me at all. Okay. Um, I, 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 a, um, a scaler, a scaler, obviously a hand scaler shouldn't do doing gently you can go at it and you can you can right. do, you can do damage but right. um um ultrasound scan it should be perfectly fine to not affect the the um the integrity of the veneer at all okay good thanks no worries thank you thank you that's that's a good question they're, they're definitely good questions sure people are thinking about this all right let's talk a little bit about shade selection in i think shade selection again is one of those very 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 important things that we need to do. If we start with a bad shade selection, nothing we can do is going to take us to a good final result. So number one is shade selection. And um, when we talk about, let me, uh, let me go about this. Sorry about that. Let me click in there. So shade selection. So very important, like we said, we don't have to repeat that. I think most of us don't pay attention to shade selection. Sometimes we just are too fast to do it. And there are things that we can do that are going to improve it, the shade selection. One of those is the environment that we are in. So the environment I mean is the, the office itself, right? Or the patient clothing or what we wear when we're with patients. Bright colors, bright colors, especially the reds, things like that are going to influence the shade of, of the, the teeth that you're trying to select a shade. So try to remove lip, lip, lipstick that is red, <coughs> the shade, uh, cover bright clothing that patient might have, because those are definitely are going to influence your shade selection. Right? I think one of the big, big misconceptions in dentistry is to use daylight to select shade. And again, goes back to dental school. I think most of us in dental school were taught that the best for shade selection is daylight. And let's think about this for a second. What daylight <clears throat> means, right? Because the, in, in the definition of daylight is very important. Definition of daylight uh, for scientists Basically, when a science talk about daylight, it's a very defined concept of daylight. It's northern exposure sunlight in the middle portion of a day that is slightly overcast. That's to be considered the optimal source. This is not as a standard daylight. Now tell me, you know, everybody of you, I live in Iowa, so, you know, daylight is from seven, in winter is 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Right, how many days is slightly overcast? And this northern exposure. Hey, we live in the, in the north, sun, uh, southern exposure most of the time, right? So for a scientist, there's a very spe special definition of what daylight means. For us, 
lay people, it means daylight. So if it's light out there, I think it's daylight. But again, the day in the morning is very different than the day in the afternoon. So that's so important that we understand this because during the day, there are different temperatures and differences that happen. So your shade guide and your tea being from different materials, they're going to look different under different light conditions. Again, ideally, there's a certain temperature, a certain type of light that is going to help us with this. So I will say is use good light to select your shade. And most offices, what we have is fluorescent light. So with the fluorescent light, you can buy daylight that is very close to the very best temperature of Kelvin degrees that is 5,500. So whenever you change the light bulbs in your office, make sure that you think about and look for these daylight ones. And those are the best. And they, are, they don't have to spend a lot of money because they are basically the same price as any of fluorescent light. So just go and look for something that says daylight. And there's a lot of specifications, but at the university in my practice, this is what we have done. We changed to daylight. So all the fluorescents in the clinics are type of daylight. So at all times in the morning or in the afternoon, we have the same consistent light. Unrelated, it can be in a storm out there or very sunny. It's the same illumination when we're selecting the shade. Believe me or not, this is so important. We just don't even think about it. If you don't have, you have an office that is nice and special illumination, get yourself a light, something like the right light too from a dent, they, that they can be a good light. It's a beautiful light to select the shade. And believe me, when you have good light, check selection is much easier. Turn your operatory light off because this is incandescent light. There's a different light that the daylight that we need to select the shade, all right? Uh, what shade guide are we going to use? Well, most composites will are key to the beta panche guide. What, there is an inherent problems with the beta panche guide, correct? We all know that. But even further, you know, there was a time that with Denehy, with my, my mentor, you know, working, you know, sometimes some composites will be, give us good results, some composites will give us bad results. Look at all these composites in the screen. So what we did is grab every composite that we could find in the shade A1. And when you look at all of these, all of these are A1 shade. So, Whenever <clears throat> you do a composite and you shade make darker, it's like you say, what is happening? I think I'm selecting a good shade when in reality, the shade that you're buying is not really even close to the shade uh, A1. Now, why this happens? Look at the A1 shade. There is the cervical portion, there is the middle, and there's the cervical and then very distinct areas with very distinct colors and different colors. So maybe this company, right, that produced this material here that is very dark, they pick the shade A1 from the top, from the cervical area. So they are matching the cervical portion of the shade tag, and they're really matching the A1, but the cervical portion, but they don't tell you that. Or this one maybe is matching more the central portion, the brighter portion. And maybe the greater ones are trying to match the incisal edges. So how do we use the Pita Panche guy for good results? Unfortunately, we can't. There are some companies that they try to match the middle of the two, but also through their iterations of new materials, they might change where to select the shape. So this is to me, when I, when we did this experiment like 30, almost 25 years ago, we were thinking, oh my God, that's why people doesn't get a good shade because we are using the Vita Pan shade guide and the dental companies matches something different in that shade guide. How, how do we know? We cannot know what part of the shade guide to do. So through the years, this is what I've done with materials. Any material that I use, that I'm going to test or I'm going to work with patients, 
I am going to do my own custom Che guy because I don't want to use that Vita Pan Che guy because I don't know what part of the tab matches the composite. But if I do a Che guy made of the composite, I know that what, <coughs> how to match it, what is the closest match, correct? So this is what I do. This happens to be the material that I use the most is Filtech Supreme Ultra from 3M. And I have no advertisement here, no ties. I don't make any more or less money. Uh, whatever you buy, I don't make any penny out of any materials that I'm talking to you about today. It's just happened that we, that's what we use in the clinics. And that's what I use a lot in my practice. So I made the, my shade guide of the composite. So how I made that, it's very simple. Let's take an impression, right? Do without any party material and you just inject some of the material, like cure it, and you gotta shave right there. So this is the A1 from um, Vita Pan. This is the A1 from Ultex Supreme Ultra. Look at that, it's a slightly brighter. You can see it's slightly brighter. So if I, Selected with a beta pan is not going to be perfect. So and then I polish the normal the way, normal way I polish them, and then I glue it to any metal tab, things like that. And then I write in that tab or whatever you can identify it what the shape is. So I'm going to go directly from this material, avoiding using the beta pan shape guide to select my shape. So this is how I'm going to select my shape. If I'm doing do a a restoration with composite in tube number eight, I am not messing around with <clears> the <throat> guide because I know very easily I can detect that my shade is going to be A2. That's the closest one. Not perfect match, but that's the closest that I have. If I use D2, it's going to be too dark. A1 is going to be too bright. So it's B1 and so is WE. So I'll try to make it of the intermediate opacity. I don't use an enamel-like or a denti-like material. I can use the intermediate opacity, the universal kind of a opacity material that they have, like the body. Filtex Supreme calls it body. Different companies call it a little different. So that's how I select my shade to make it uh, the best I can, I can make it. Right? And in my experience, and all the cases that I show you before, and you'll be surprised, but some of those cases are done with several materials. There's not only one, there are several brands that I've used those cases over the years, but I always select the shade with the material that I'm using, not with the Vita Pan shade guy again, for the reasons I told you. Make sure that the teeth are clean, right? Because plaque is going to make it darker. So that's a common mistake that people do. Like you asked me before, when you select the shade, this is the first thing you do or you anesthetize your patient, and immediately in the meantime, the patient gets anesthetized, that's when you select the shade. But it's important to keep the teeth wet in this process. Why? Because the teeth dehydrate. And dehydrate is going to change the color of the teeth to be brighter and more opacious. So as soon as they start drying, they change, the color start changing, that shade start changing to bright and opaque. So you do not, you wanna be, you wanna, don't want to let him dry. You want to be brief. Um, let, me, let me ask you this question. I always ask the same question when I'm lecturing. I am so, I'm sure it's happened to all of you that when you are selecting a shade, you, you look at the shade guy, no matter what you're selecting the shade for composite or crowns, and you are at the beta pan shade guy, you say, oh, this shade looks good. And you keep looking at it and all of a sudden, oh, A1 looks good. Oh, but B1 looks good too. And all of a sudden D2 is good too. So the whole shade tab looks great. That happens to all of us. You know why? Because we keep staring and we need to be brief. Why we need to be brief? Because the eye human brain combination give us only four, five, six seconds at most to make a decision about a shade. And the human eye and brain is ingrained into us that look for differences, not for similarities. So as the, these uh, cells in, the, in the, um, those um, uh, cones in the eye get tired, passes more than four or five seconds, the ability to look at 
shade difference is gone or it's gone. So be brief. So why, how I do select the shade? I try to do it by a process of elimination. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Do a process of elimination, um, eliminate the shades that are far and just try to eliminate and use this like five second rule to eliminate shades. Also select the shade from the middle of the tube because if the shade guide has multiple shades, so is the tube. If I show you that tube and ask you what shade it is, well, and if I mask it, look at this. Wow, that's a very different shade that you are seeing there from the same tube. It's the same tube, but inside it's going to look different in the middle. And wow, look at the cervical portion. Looks very different. It's kind of reddish influence of the gingiva. And it's the same tube, but when you mask it, it's different shades. So the best area to select the shade of the tooth for composite is in the middle. The incisal is too translucent, the cervical is too reddish because the influence of the gingiva. So you wanna look at the middle of the tooth with your own made chain guide. That's the, best, that's the best advice that I can give you and to get a better result. So and again, that's what I showed you before. What is the real shade of the tooth right there? When you mask it, you, mask, you can mask the tooth, but you can mask the shade up and either you haven't made this from the material you use, this is what you get, very different shades. So again, middle of the tooth with the shade you made. Best position, middle of the tooth. So another piece of advice that I can give you is if you are using this for crown and bridge and you are you know, used to do it or you use it, I can give you a piece of advice. They come in A, B, C's, and D's. But you know what? In the clinics, we don't have it by A, B, C's, and D's because we know that the closest shade to the A1 is the D1. <clears throat> and then the D2 is so close to each other. So when you're selecting the shade, if you're running from one place to the other one, you are spending those seconds that are good for you to differentiate color in moving the shade up. So what we do, what we have it, it's a range from light to dark. This is not necessarily value because in terms of value, th there are differences. This perceived from light to dark, all right? It's perceived from light to dark. So some of the things, when you put it from light to dark, some things may surprise you. And one of the things that might surprise you is you see D4 here and D3 here, and D4 looks brighter than D3. Unbelievable, but that's the some of irrationality of the beta panche guy. The beta panche guy is the, not the, the smartest shade out there. It was done before we even care about shades of teeth. So if you arrange it this way from light to dark, you are going to, it's much easier to identify the shade, the closest shade that you might have to restore a tool with direct resins. And so how do we select the shade? We are going to find the closest match. And you might ask yourself, what are you talking about the closest match? Because the color of teeth is, there are millions of options, the color of teeth. Like everybody is different, right? We have different palm prints, the kind of shade or everything in the body, human body is, is like that. And there is not, not a like. So even though we like to put it in, in drawers and compartments, it's going to be rare that you find a perfect match. Usually you, you're finding the closest match. And how you do this by a process of elimination. So I like to use Spock as, you know, as an example of how to do things, how to select a shade. Because his logic is, and after you hear this, once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So one day I was watching the movie or the episode that they were talking about this and I, and I thought, oh my God, I can use this to teach my students. So what I did is change this a little bit to once you have eliminated the impossible shades, whatever shade remains, however probably must be the true shades, but we don't know that it's not a true shade, is the closest shade. So I'm going to use Spock logic to select a shade. So, how do I go about it? 
I know that the teeth need to be wet. I have only few seconds to eliminate shakes, correct? So I'm going to lift the lip, make sure that my patient is laying back because the light is coming from the top. If I have a special lighting, then I could use a special lighting, but usually the light comes from the top. So what I will do is kind of close my eyes, open my eyes, and what I will do is run the shade like this, right? And I'm not trying to find a match. I'm trying to eliminate shades. So when you see this, we know that this is a fairly bright shade. So what are we going to eliminate? We're going to eliminate the right, correct? So in one pass, I can eliminate the half or a lot of this. Then I rest my eyes and I have another two, two three seconds and I keep eliminating shades, correct? So what shades I'm going to eliminate here I'm going to eliminate the ones on the right or immediately select three shades that might be closest. And then once more, I look at them and out of these ones, I am not thinking which one is the best. I am thinking which one is the worst. So to me, the worst is B2, correct? So eliminate B2 because again, we rarely will find a match. We're going to find a closest. So which one is the worst A1, which one is the closest B1. So that's the shade, that's the shade that happened in Marmentarium. That's exactly what I'm going to use. And going back to selecting with our own shade guide, when you look at this, don't think about which one is the closest. Think about which ones are bad. So that's what I eliminate. Immediately I know that white is too white, too bright. B1 is too bright, this is too dark. Maybe these limit two options here. And I'm not thinking which one is the best. I'm thinking which one is the worst. Because if we think which one is the best, that's when we trick ourselves. So think about if you have those two left, which one would you select is, uh, let me go back, sorry about that. Let me go back in here and then think about which one you select. Eliminate B2. Eliminate B1, eliminate A1, and you are left with A2. Because that's what you have in your momentarium. So how are you going to restore these two? Basically, you're going to use the A2 to restore that particular two, because that's the closest shade you have. And that's kind of a number one. The most important to restore a two is to understand the shade and how the shade of composites work, all right? The next point that we could talk about it is pretty much um, a stratification. And that, it takes a little longer to explain a little bit of how we are going to restore a tool. And remember what we talk about that when you look at a tool, some cases, that case of the wife, I, I keep referring back to that case of the wife or the dentist that she has dentinian love showing through, they have a halo and translucency, how you can imitate that. So if this is the class four, if you put one shade of composite, it's going to look fairly monochromatic. So you will not be able to restore that tooth with halo and translucency and dentinian loves if you use one shade of composite or the universal opacity. So that is related to the, how many shades, how, um, how you're going to build the composite, all right? So there are different layering techniques. There is the universal layering that in which you have just a one material, one opacity to build that class four. If you are inclined to do a little more aesthetic restoration and that is tied with the money, Correct, because I charge different what I charge for this, that I charge for this because this takes me longer, meaning I'm going to replace dentin with a dentin-like material. And I'm going to replace enamel with enamel-like material to create the optical properties of enamel and dentin. Dentin in the, in the core and enamel surrounding the dentin. Or you can, to imitate or create a halo and translucency, use multi-layering techniques, multiple shades, multiple opacities to 
create this halo and translucency. So again, there's different type of layering techniques out there to really work in different teeth because if a patient like this comes to me with a class four, you know, something like this, we know that this interaction of enamel and dentin makes this tooth look like this. The dentin is very thin as it gets to the size of ledge. Some of the light goes through, some of the light is scattered, you see the halo, correct? A tooth like this is very different, it doesn't have halo and translucency, it's more like a gradient of shades. And this shade is more like a monochromatic tooth. So I always look at two things, the shade and what is the appearance of the tooth to see how I'm going to build it up. Um, because again, there are different, different teeth and different um, circumstances that make it so different. For example, just give you some more examples here. This is a fairly monochromatic tooth that I need to build up. When I look at the adjacent tooth, the color from the cervical to the inside side is very monochromatic. So what am I going to use? I am not going to use a multi-layer technique for aesthetic reasons because it's a fairly monochromatic tooth, right? So that's what I do, correct? So again, show you black and white, a good integration of this composite, single one. So when would I use the two-layer technique? I will use the two-layer technique in a case like this because when I look at this tooth, there is a gradient of shade. Look at the cervical, it's more rich in color, right? A little darker because the enamel is thinner. You can see the denting a little bit more and towards the inside side, it's just a little more grayish. So I know that if I put a monochromatic material, one single shade, I will not be able to restore this tooth aesthetically. You want to do it functionally, not aesthetically. And that's the difference. You can restore for function and for aesthetic. Ideally, we need to restore for function and aesthetic in this nowadays in this world. So that's what I did for that particular case. Has a dentin core in an enamel-like material in the outside to create that appearance of translucency. You have to have that type. So if I show you a diagram, this is pretty much what I did to create that restoration. Other type of uh, multichromatic restorations that I can show you is the one that I showed you before, correct? This is a patient that we talked at the beginning that the mom kind of dragged him in. So we did internal bleaching, we did some external bleaching and a tooth like this to create this effect of translucency and a halo, you have to do a multi-layer approach to be able to restore this tooth for aesthetics. And of course, function like we talk about it. So teeth in terms of aesthetics can be restored in different ways to create different effects. The monochromatic effect, the gradient effect, and the gradient effect with halo and mamelons. Each one requires a different level of I would say more than this, I guess the skill is important, but recognition of what you're trying to achieve. Once you know where to go, you can find ways to get there. So once we start seeing difference between teeth, not only in shape, but in shape, we should be able to get there with these layering, different layering styles. Uh, I can show you other examples. Um, you can see right here the tooth. And there is some lines you can see, try to imitate the lines and patients is quite happy about this. We can see the very good integration just with composite. Again, we could have done a crown, we would have put a veneer, but we're talking composites today. So the only important thing that I, you know, time, unfortunately time is just, is, a, is our enemy today because we only have two hours. Um, when I do these courses, usually it's a, it's, a, it's almost a full day course. And um, when we work with my good friend, Bob Marges, we are doing this course over days sometimes. So uh, let's talk about cavity preparation. Cause I think if I can leave you with two scenes today, shade selection and cavity preparation, you are going to be ahead of the curve for creating blend of the resin composites. 
So cavity preparation is the only thing that I, I think is fundamental to create very good aesthetic restorations. Why? Because we have these, remember we select the shade, we found a shade what was the closest shade to the tool we're trying to build up. How do we create the effect of blending or make this composite disappear and in perfect shade disappear into a different shade and make it blend, right? So we do this by doing cavity preparation. So no matter what tool I'm doing, I am going to have this special way to do my cavity preparation. Right? Modern principle of cavity preparation teach us to remove decay, right? Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes we remove all restorative material, not necessarily we are removing all the time. The material is well bonded. Uh, we might leave it. Sometimes we may create a pulp exposure trying to remove the material. We might leave that and bond over it by um, air abrasion. We remove thin undermined enamel that might break due to the shrinkage of the materials. And what we do is a bevel. So let's talk about that bevel, right? So let's say that you have a class four that you're going to restore and you need to create a very good functional aesthetic restoration. So let's look about, let's talk about the bevels. There is a lingual bevel and we have a facial bevel. The lingual bevel, and we do all the bevels with a diamond, right? We are going to create a bevel that we call a functional bevel, right? We're going to just cut into the enamel, you can see there, and about a, no more than a 45 degree angle. And why we wanna create this 45 degree angle is because we wanna expose the end of the enamel rods so we can bond to the end of the enamel rods, not to the side of the enamel rods because the bond to the side of the enamel rods it's very weak, right? The bone to the end of the enamel rods, that's what it holds the restoration in place. So that's the lingual, we think about the functional part of the tooth. It's about the thickness of the enamel. So we start at the DEJ. And in some situations that faces with a deep bite, I tend to do a chamfer instead of a bevel. Let's expose the end of the enamel rods and creating a little more thickness of the material right back there. So what about the facial enamel, the facial bevel? The facial bevel is a bigger bevel, longer bevel. So this is a functional aesthetic bevel. It's functional because you are exposing the end of the rods for a strength and good increasing the bonded area. It's aesthetic because when you restore, it's going to go from thin thick to thin, I'll show you a, a diagram of that. So it's a steeper angle when you are preparing it. It's longer two to three millimeters in length compared to the one millimeter in the lingual that is only a functional bevel. So it goes from the thickness of full thickness of enamel and a little bit into the dentin. So when you build, it kind of goes from thick to thin and makes the, the restoration disappear, no matter what layer and style you're using. So again, you select your shade, you select the layering style, you say, I'm going to do monochromatic. It's no difference if you say, I'm going to do two, three layers or very aesthetic or elaborate buildups to create aesthetic results. So we make what is called an infinite bevel. What an infinite bevel means? Please pay attention to the internal line angles and the color surface margin here in the facial. What we do is grab a softlex disc and kind of smooth all the surface everywhere around we smooth it and heal all the edges. And why we want to do that is because once we place that restoration, this imperfect shade that we selected, correct? It's going to go from thick to thin. And what happens is disappears because they, the, our materials that we use, they're fairly somehow translucent. So the light goes through the material and reaches the tooth, as the, tooth, the, the color of the tooth bounces out, this effect of the resin is, the, is much less here than here. So the effect of the color of the resin diminish and the influence of the color of the tooth increases as it goes thinner. So that's how you're creating that blending, like a contact lens effect 
that we talk in ceramics, that's how you create it in composites by making it very, very thin. It's so thin that it doesn't have any influence in the shape. So it diminishes the influence. So that's what we do pretty much for all, the, all preparations. What else do we do? We do a scalloping bevel. A lot of people ask me, Marcos, why do you do a scalloping bevel? What's the benefit and why you do it? Well, the benefit is that the human eye detects the straight lines very easy, very easy to follow a straight line. But when you ask somebody to follow a curve, the, 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 your brain needs to be more acute to follow a curve because it changes. So that's the same effect when we're doing composites. We want this thickness to change and this level to change to create this blending effect. And that's once we do that with the diamond, then we will go ahead and use a suplex disc or any disc out there to smooth the margins and smooth everything to create that infinite bevel that we're talking about. So when you look at something like this and I have a higher magnification, what you see, you can see because the reflection, this is scalloping, correct? But at the same time, because it goes to infinite or disappearing bevel, this is the zone of blending that I was explaining. The material blends into two the structure. And that's what I think it makes it all the materials, that, all the cases that I show you, no matter how big or, small, uh, big or small they are, they disappear really nicely. If I have a class three, I'm going to do exactly the same because I want to blend that restoration into the two. So I'm going to put to practice everything that we talk about. I'm going to move the, remove the old restorative material. I'm going to go ahead and decay. And basically that's my prep. It's, it's no more the concept of class one, class two, class three. Basically what we do is remove decay and do the barrels. We don't do any more like two or three millimeters in depth. No, just remove decay and that's your prep basically for composites. And do I have to do a scalloping here? No, because I already have a curve margin, so I don't have to worry about it. And then you can see I've got my sufflex smoothed and I have a disappearing class three right there. Just to give you an example, this is a friend of mine that for a long, long time he smoked pipes, correct? Smoking a pipe and then he developed these, you can see the mark where the pipe was. So over the years, kind of a word on and finally he says, I'm quitting. So he says, can you fix this? And I, I never wanted to fix it because I said, you are going to break it. That's a functional demand. You're putting something in the mouth that is not a, not food, right? It's a tool, you're using your data's tool to grab, to hold the pipe. So I never, and then finally he stopped and that's what we did. Again, just bevels. You can see the bevels right here. This to this is what is called an infinite bevel and we build up the central, the lateral. At this point, you have to be, again, you are increasing the incise a lead, length, right? And we also did the lower ones to match because there was where the bottoms do. So now you have to, at this point, adjust your occlusion and just in a way that like we talked before, that the protrusive movement most teeth are working in the protrusive movement to really distribute the forces. You don't wanna have the two that you restore touching in the lateral movement. You wanna create um, a balance, multiple teeth, distribute the force on multiple teeth. Don't put it in one tooth or in the composite you restore because very likely that's going to be the cause of the cheating. When we talk about this, also think about crossover. Sometimes we just don't think about crossover. We go to the canine and says, oh, Canine is protecting them. Once you move to crossover, all of a sudden the canine go over, that's crossover, then you get the central touching. So you have to be very aware that a lot of people at night will go to crossover and cheat your composite. For all you have had patients that all of a sudden you're doing a composite and it breaks and they say, I didn't do anything. And very likely they're at night and they're, they're like clenching, doing something, moving the jaw and hidden right there. So you ask them to go to crossover, you can see exactly where the lower teeth fractured your upper teeth. And that's quite common when you're looking for fractures or your restoration fracture, that's quite quite common one. So that's pretty much um, talking about bevels. Um, uh, let me show you a video on that, how I do this bevel, because when I'm doing this bevel, 
I am doing this by um, not a, I am not doing this step by step. I am doing this organically. So it's not I do the devil and the scalloping. When when you look at the diamond, you are going to see that the diamond coming in a second, it's coming up. Look at this. I start with a burr fairly steep. And then when I'm doing the scalloping, you can see doing the scalloping, right? And then the burr moves and climbs in such a way that I'm doing the infinite bevel. So yes, to explain it, I explained that it's a bevel first, and then you scallop it, and then you smooth it. But everything happens at the same time. I don't do the bevel first, then the scalloping, and, and then the smooth it. I try to do it with a diamond. I do end up doing this with a soft mix, but that's kind of the idea um, behind um, doing something like this. And then you grab your disc, and what I'm doing right there, and try to also include the proximals so because you want the composite to grab the facial, the lingual, to create a good sense of um, um, a wrap around kind of situation when we are working with this. So then we're going to etch, uh, just going through the steps, no matter what layer we're using it, right? We're going to build it um, in different ways. I, again, we don't necessarily have a lot of time to talk about these techniques. And the last part that I want to show, talk a little bit is about the, the polishing and contouring. Because, you know, it, it's just, it's not the same when you don't polish this restoration to, to, to a good high degree. So I'm going to show you um, kind of a little bit of a step-by-step -step of doing this. And briefly, I am going to take you through what we call a 10 steps for contouring and polishing. So we got a publication with my good friend, um, Bob Marges. Um, if you're interested, Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry, you can send me an email. I'll be happy to um, send you a copy of this. I'll give you my email at the end. But So this is the case that I showed you that I was doing, correct? Um, I love to use a rubber dam, and most of my cases you see the rubber dam, but not every patient accepts a rubber dam. But again, we have to have good isolation. So we're going to go in this case with a traction core and I'm going to do this all at the same time. My technique is pretty much all at the same time, make sure that I'm not bonding in between. And then really what I'm going to do is do a systematic step-by-step -step approach. So the first thing I'm going to do when I have, after my buildups, you can see that eh, doesn't look exactly like teeth. Looks like marbles at this point, correct? So I noticed over the years that people have a hard time finishing composite because they don't necessarily have, they, they know it looks bad. They just don't know how to fix it. And with this 10 step that we do with my good friend Bob Marcus, like I say, is to point to anatomical features one step at a time that I can, applies to every composite you work, class threes, class four, all interiors work on the same principle. Now a class three, of course, there's no length, Right, so you skip number one. So, but you want to get the length first. You can have a suffix, a diamond, and get the length that you want. And then at this point, you might even remove your rubber dam and start working with the occlusion if needed to be. The second point that we pay attention to is the incisal facial line angle. So I'm going to paint it because when I look from the occlusal, I want to have these incisal facial line angle of all the teeth kind of match. That tells me if I build a tube more than the other one, if I overbuild it, and that's the way I go. Then the, the third, I have the profile. Since I have the incisal facial where I want, and pretty the cervical is pretty much where I want, I am going to bring and create a nice contour, a facial contour, and then you can do it with a diamond. You can do it with a soft flex. I kind of use both to do this. Number four, I'm going to paint the line angles. So unfortunately, in these larger cases, you have to have a little bit of a technician in you to mark your line angles, your, and then you mark your line angles where you want it. You might modify them with a soft flex, with a diamond. Um, in this case, I'm moving my line angles to where I really wanted them. Sometimes I paint it with red, what it is, 
with the tensing sideways. I'm going to take it with blue where I wanted it to move them. Number five, I'm going to look at my embrasures, make sure that I have a very good consistent embrasure going towards the distal from the midline. And I might open the embrasure with a fine or with a soft flex. And then I'm working on my point angles. Uh, point angle is where the line angle meets the incisor the ledge. Then I'm going to go um, to do my axial inclination for veneers. If I'm doing veneers, I will, I will skip that step. The step that the, number A will be the pressures of elevations. So I create depressions and very schematic if I need to. And, all of, and then I'm going to get my gloss and I go with, there's a lot of good polishes in the market. This happens to be uh, from care. Again, no commercial interest in nothing, any of this. And you get a good night gloss and that's a result you are going to get. Yeah, it could be different. One of the things that always people points out to me is that my laterals are different. My centers tend to be the same, but my laterals are a little bit different. And that's on purpose because I want them to look this natural. I don't want chiclets. I'm kind of a little bit an enemy of the picket fence. So always my right is going to be a little different than the left. That is, in my opinion, is quite normal. And I want to follow that a little bit of, a, I would call it a flare. I don't know whatever you call it, but I think when you see a technician doing their work, they there is always something to characterize them. When we do something, there is something that we do that tend to characterize it. And over the years, I noticed that my laterals are different and I kind of like it. And I, that's what I kind of like. I, and that's the smile. And it's a very good result with resin composites. Another question that people ask me, how long does it take you to do this? Well, I can do something like this definitely under two hours. If I cannot do it under two hours, it's not, it's not profitable. My, even though I'm an academic, people say, oh, you're an academic, you have all the time in the world. No, I don't. I run, I, it's a private practice and I run it like a private practice. Like I mentioned, I have two hygienists. So I work it like a private practice and I'm very profitable in my private practice. Um, Whoever comes, you know, says, oh my God, you know, and then a lot of things is because we are very predictable, the things we do. So to get very good results, uh, in these situations uh, with this particular patient. Hey, hey, can hey, Marco, patient. Marcos, can I, can I interrupt you? Oh yeah. Okay, and I apologize if I was kind of distracting in and out. I got that my Mexican internet kind of sometimes goes out. So you kind of lost me there for a minute, but um, so what do you, you're scheduling two hours for eight facial veneers like that. What, what do you typically would schedule like for a class four or even a class three? Uh, probably about half an hour, no more than that. You know, I start to finish. Patient sits, patient gets up. And one of the things that I do in my practice is, like we talk about shade selection. My my assistant, she's great at shade selection. So I'm putting the rubber down. So I might be running to the hygienist, seeing a second patient sometimes. Um, we slow down a little bit over the years, but um, I just want to do a little, yeah, I want to do less work and charge more maybe. <laughs> You know, we go more a lot of before yeah. service in the past. So, um, that my my assistant, she's really good at shade selection, putting the rubber down. So I'm running around and she oh, is yeah. selecting the shade, already, putting it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do a it's, lot of things that I, I trained him to do. Yeah. So the polishing system, you were using the Kerr, which is a two part, a two part polisher, right? Correct. And have you tried many of the, cause I know people are thinking this, you know, there's a lot of the, the single polishers. You know, I used to use Astropol for years, which is three, you know, now they have Optopol and it's one. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on these different polishing systems? You know, I never found one. So one polisher, like a one step that really gives me a high shine compared to two steps. Like this is two steps, right? This is going right. to be a blue coarse medium. And then this is going to be the final one that is diamond impregnated. That is going to be with that enamel like gloss. And right. every one that you've seen, you can see that this is ceramic like finish. It's very smooth and maintain their polish because they're polished, they're less likely to pick up a stain. So I never found one polisher, one step polisher that is good as the two. I think the two is the minimum to get that shine. Yeah, I, I every company. Yeah. Go ahead. I would agree with you on that. Um, every time I've tried to switch to a one, 
I, I, it doesn't perform as well. As a few yeah, that's again, that's also my experience that they're not as good as the two steps. You know, Astropol is a very good system. Um, there's several systems out there that are really good. Ivo Clars are, are, are pretty uh, good. Uh, some people like the softflex disk, go through the sequence. That's kind of like a five days before this. Right, before this. Yeah. Yeah. That works well too. A lot of people like that very smooth finish of the softflex. Yeah. I think the softflex is great, or the, all these all these disks. Uh, I don't want to mention necessarily the same brand, but all these disks, um, they tend to make things flat instead yeah. of giving that sometimes the, the service we're looking for. Uh, yeah. in a Let me ask you another question because it came up early and I and we just didn't get to it, but I think this might be a good time. Um, you know, the, one of the very first cases you showed when number eight was dark, right? And so you decided to do a, a full facial veneer on that. How much, so assuming that that tooth, you know, I look at it from an indirect, right? I look at that thing and okay, if if it's in the right position in the arch, and my porcelain is going to be 0.2 to 0.3, but now it's got to have some opacity. So I'm looking at 0.5 to 0.7 probably would be my reduction on that dirt, that dark tooth. I would probably use a 0.5 millimeter depth cutting burr and remove 0.5. So I could build in some opacity and translucency within the indirect restoration. How, how much, so assuming this tooth is in the correct position in the arch, how much tooth structure are you removing there? I'm always thinking the, the less, the better. So one of the reasons why you can see a little darkening in the cervical area is because the enamel in the cervical area is at most 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters. Right. So I want to have my margins in enamel. Yeah. So sometimes I will sacrifice some aesthetic just to have that enamel out there, even though the tooth might look dark. Um, now, I do understand that some people will never accept that. And those are the cases that I might be doing more aggressive reparations. But if I can get away, not removing that cervical enamel, I think I'm increasing the longevity of everything I do. So that's one of the balances you always have, removing cervical enamel. But I will think about 0.6 millimeters or something like that, yeah. especially in the body of the tooth, 0.6, right. 0.7, because I'm thinking and that in this case, to, to, if we try to, we try to bleach this tooth, because if you bleach it, obviously you don't have to remove as much. But if you right. cannot bleach it, then you have to remove to, to mask it. That becomes a, a, a steady concern. That's what the patient comes to us. Right. So I will do 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and I'm thinking about, I need to put an opaque. Right. right? And my opaque is going to be, one of the best opaque out there in the market is cosmetic opaques. Uh, they have, again, no commercial interest, for those who didn't hear that, it's Cosmodent out of Chicago. Yeah. Exactly. Cosmodent has the best opakers. And you know why they, why they have the best opakers? Because they really match it, the center of the Vita Panche guy. Oh, okay. So they have a A1, B1, LO. They also have a pink opaker to increase the warm. So you put up about a 0.5, a 0.1 millimeter of opaker and look at the tooth. And you're trying to match the value of the adjacent tooth. But remember that the value of adjacent to it at that, that point is lower because you are prepping. So you want that a value to be a little higher when you're opaque in it, right? So the A1 opaque, the, my two, I want to get A1. Again, the cosmetic is not great because it gives you an A1, but they know that you have to make it a little more bright to really increase the, the value of your denting, right? Or your covering. So they are getting warmed and they are getting the opacity to build it. And then you can build it. Once you have that, you need to decrease the opacity. So uh, maybe a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters of a denting-like material. And, and, and the final three, four tenths, it's going to be a, a, an enamel-like material yeah. to give it yeah. that depth. Yeah. You put an so, opaque, opaque and everything's too thick, it doesn't look good. Yeah. So it'd be a similar preparation as an indirect. It's kind of interesting that you mentioned Cosmonet. Probably a lot of the young dentists don't know who Buddy Mopper is, but Buddy was the, the founder and the owner of Cosmonet. He was one of the best composite veneer person I've ever seen. And he was, a, he was actually a pedonist, I mean, of all, of all things. But I remember having a conversation with him about why I would do porcelain, why he would do resin. He says, yeah, I always take tooth away. 
you know, and so our preps kind of look the same. And that's why, you know, originally we talked about time and money. I mean, that's a huge advantage um, to what you're doing. So let me ask you another question. So assuming that last case that you showed, when you did those, I think you did eight. Are you doing, because you're building an incisal and you're building a shelf, are you doing a single tooth at a time? Or are you doing the lingual shelf on all of them and then coming back and putting some lobing? How, how are you managing multiple teeth like that? If you look at those teeth, look at that. There is, if I am doing direct resins, veneers, like in this case, if I have to multiple layer it with a dentine and an enamel and translucent and whatever like that, then all of a sudden my time goes from this to this. Right. And all of a sudden, what I'm charging for that resin veneer is just not enough. I'm losing money. Right. And I am in the business of dentistry, not to make a lot of money, but to make some money. It's a business. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. I always say 51% is, is dentistry, 49% is business. I, I heard from somewhere, I don't remember where, but I, I heard it some, somewhere and it is the truth. You only want to do the best dentistry you can, but it's also a part of the business. So if I'm going to start multi-layering, my time is going to go far that I will not be able to make any money in a reasonable, reasonable manner. So I'm going to do, in this case, they're fairly mono, they are monocratic. They are only one shade. Right. So I got a matrix and then I do the lingual all at the same time. And then I do final increments. Everything is pretty much at the same time. Okay. I am not, um, maybe I have another case right here. So, oh yeah, look at this. Just to take you a little bit through this case, right? So let's go fairly fast to this case. But so you notice what I'm doing right there. I'm going to be building the four interiors. So I'm going to put it, this is a Toffermeyer band, you know, uh, for the ones that are young that never use a Toffermeyer band is what we use for amalgams. Right. And I'm etching all at the same time, right? And I am adhesive, putting my, this is opt, having to be optimal fail and light curing. And the light curing portion right here, um, before I light cure, I will run a, a mylar strip make sure in between the teeth, make sure that they are not bonded together. So that means at my prep, at my prep, I am lighting in the contact so I can put my letter strips through it, correct? So I'm going to do, and then put my lingual layer at the same time. So place my matrix, spread the materials over the matrix, correct? And just do the palatal, whatever thickness it is. Correct. And then I am going to, after that, I will place, if you are going to layer, you can layer, but I will place, again, I'm working with a medium opacity to do these veneers and just kind of all at the same time. So I'm working kind of like that. You see, I'm placing, you can see multi, the four already, I am in the final layer right here. And we can't see that. Oh, can you see it? Oh, I'm sorry. No. So I'm placing yeah. my final layer right there, right? Build the lingual. If I need to build the proximal, I will build the proximal, but it will, this happens to be the compo roller from Cares and all, all um, sequence. Yeah. And then my final increments. Now, in, in some cases you might put some stains. You can see here a little bit of stains, right? I'm just kind of getting fancy there. I try not to put any stains. So that will do just a lingual increment and a facial increment with the same medium opacity material. And constantly I'm running a mylar strip in between so that I don't get the bonding together. So I'm doing pretty much at the same time. And like you're in and I'm just go through my finishing steps, like I mentioned before, but again, it's in two, basically two increments. And those are the uh, uh, hobby oh, care polishers. Yeah. Those are the ones that I'm talking about. And you can see the high shine these get for composite, you know, the reflection yeah. right there on the photos yeah. and brushes and everything. And of course, the occlusion, you have to always check your occlusion, make sure that, you know, they are uh, mutually protected and as many teeth as you can, at this, like we talk about that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm glad you showed that, Marcus. You know, the one thing that I always say is what, what we're seeing on Facebook and Instagram is so unrealistic a lot of times, you know, where these 
you know, they're isolating a single tooth and they're building it up like a ceramic. And, you know, I call it dental porn. It's like, God damn, that's awesome. Right. But that person is not making any money doing that. I mean, they're spending an hour plus per tooth and they're going to the next tooth. They're photographing it, photographing it. And, and I think that, you, you know, you, you brought it up. I mean, yeah, we want to do beautiful dentistry. We want to meet our patient's needs, but we do have to make a living, right? Our assistant, our front office wants to get paid at the end of the day. And so does our, our landlord or the bank. And I, and I think it's important what you showed in that, you know, we can do this. We can get beautiful results like you get, but it, it doesn't have to be like we see on Instagram all the time. You know, it's, it's, we need to make this profitable. We need to make it practical, practical. We need to make it efficient. And I'm, I'm glad you should move. Absolutely. You know, just, I'm going to make a little um, plug for myself here. <laughs> That's all right. You know, when, uh, um, um, you can see these when we, you know, Bob, Bob Marges, right? Yeah, no, I know Bob. Bob really. Yeah. It's a great guy. And over the years, we, he's my teacher, he's my friend, and we, we have these courses. And one of the things that we stress is that, like you just say, in dentistry, we need to make money, you know, because like you see those cases, probably that people leave out of making lectures to show in those minimal cases that they do, they photograph for three, four hours, and that's what they, they show and they go on lecture and, and that's not realistic. That to yeah. me, like I agree with you, it's not realistic. You know, more power to the people that does it that way and they get these amazing results. But I think there is a, again, like I mentioned before, there is a, what is the degree of aesthetics we wanna achieve? And we can achieve it with residents, but it's going to take it much longer to do it. So it becomes a point that when it becomes profitable for the dentist, right? We, we shouldn't be losing money. So yeah. uh, there's a time that I would say, there's no way I can do this case to the aesthetic that the patient wants doing direct residents. I have to move to porcelain veneers. And, yeah. uh, and then porcelain veneers have to be as, like we talk about as conservative as composite, but definitely they are more expensive. But at the same time, it's going to give them maybe a little more aesthetic, like we discussed yeah. before. Yeah. No, I agree. So we're, we got to wind up, man. This is freaking awesome. Um, someone asked if, you know, you use condensable, you, you know, like you did um, with the 3M. Do you ever use a flowable? I mean, occasionally I'll use like, I have a class got a really nice trans opal flowable that I'll like layer on the inside of the ledge sometimes when I do these. Are you using a flowable in any of these cases at all? Yeah. A lot of the cases, um, I can use flowables. There's good techniques of injectables that the injectable composites you can do. And, you know, I think for whatever reason, I think flowables have got a bad rep. When in reality, there are good materials to, um, to use. And then sometimes they have a very high strength, but again, it depends on the functional demands. You know, I, I show this case to my prosthodontist friends that I do, that. I do the whole arch, uh, the whole bottom arch I did with composite and it's increasing vertical dimension just with direct composites. And they right. say, no, that's not going to last. Yeah. And then I show them five years results. And then if I had 10 years and they start looking, it's like, oh, well, oh, because you did it. <laughs> yeah. No, 15 years. Oh, there's no way they can last 15 years. And then I show them that the upper arch is a full denture. And they say, oh, of course they last that long. And I say, well, yeah, you didn't ask me what's a posing one because it's so important what is the functional demands and we need to be aware that the function that are so important to select our materials. And I think we don't necessarily think too much about that. Yeah, good. Um, do you have a, you know, I know you showed the slide here, but it doesn't really give us any information. Is there an email no. address or, or if they well, want- this is, a, this is a course that we have with Bob, you know, um, and, and here's my email. And oh, thank okay. you very much. And, and I'm gonna show you my email. Thank you very much um, for having me. It's been great, awesome. you know, the interaction we had. This is my email, so uh, you can ask me any questions. I sometimes it takes a little longer to answer, but yeah, I answer yeah. all mm -hmm. the time. Um, feel free okay. to send me an email. Yeah. And we have courses with Bob through Felon Dental, uh, Felon Dental Seminars. Right. That's what it is. And if you want to learn a little more, we have a lot of content, videos. We go from uh, class one, class two, to direct veneers, resins. We do bleaching microbration, infiltration. We do everything that is aesthetics uh, with direct. We do have bonding, things like that. But again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Yeah.